welcome to Ideas of India, a podcast where we examine academic ideas that can propel India forward. My name is Shruti Rajagopalan and today my guest is Dr. Chinmay Tumbe, an assistant professor of economics at the Indian Institute of Management in Ahmedabad and the author of India Moving: A History of Migration. We spoke about Chinmay's most recent book, The Age of Pandemics, 1817 to 1920. and how they shaped india and the world we talked about how pandemics are remembered or forgotten in collective memory the relationship between religion and pandemics and caste and pandemics how to think about western versus asian medicine how to estimate deaths in a world where record keeping is poor chinmay's intellectual influences and much more for a full transcript of this conversation including helpful links of all the references mentioned click the link in the show notes or visit discoursemagazine.com Chinmay welcome to the show thanks for having me over one of the first things i realized when i read your wonderful book is that we have really forgotten that there was something called the age of pandemics even though this is not that far back in history right and of the 72 million that died globally you estimate that 40 million people died in the indian subcontinent so this was not a small loss and you know this is the sort of loss that you should hear about in every song that should you know have its own memorial days that should have special temples or sites you know that commemorate a particular you know event or tragedy and we just don't seem to have that in india Why do you think that is is it because it's morbid and unpleasant is it because in India we have an oral tradition you know in the Indian regional languages which is quite different from the you know western way of recording these things is it because we cremate so we don't have cemeteries where we can walk through and easily do a count 200 years later what is the reason for this you know sort of you know loss of collective memory or consciousness over pandemics It's a great question, and I think there are various ways to look at it. Uh, one is, of course, that the bacteria or the virus is, you know, not a clearly defined enemy, like say for many Indians, the British Empire or something like that. So the lack of a clearly identifiable enemy means you're less likely to have commemorations. So we have, for example, the Jallianwala Bagh tragedy of April 1919, which killed a few hundred people. Every Indian knows about this. but just a few months earlier you know 20 million indians died during the influenza pandemic 20 million versus a few hundred you would think that you know the 20 million tragedy would register but you know i never learned about the influenza pandemic in my school but i definitely learned about the jinnan one about tragedy so that's one way to look at it that is pandemics viruses bacteria people see it as an act of god or they don't see really it as a calamity which is enforced by somebody else that's probably one reason the other is that pandemics compared to wars even natural calamities like earthquakes floods don't leave behind a visual memory in the sense that like earthquake destroys a city so buildings are broken so you can see the effects of that wars you know the bombs even the terror strikes in bombay a few years back there you know, the bullets marks in in the building walls and so on so pandemics kill labor from an economic perspective you know it kills labor but not capital stock and so that's why that's i think one of the reason why pandemics have slipped out of memory across the world not just uh, in india they have been memorialized a little bit when they have been there for many many years for example plague there's a plague temple in bangalore or of cholera temples and so on but broadly you know I, i would say compared to how the black death of the 14th century has registered in the european consciousness kids learn about it because one third of europe was knocked out i think that's another reason why you know we kind of completely forgot about this so lack of clearly identifiable enemy the fact that they don't leave visual markers uh, the fact that our history textbooks obsess about political history rather than say economic demographic or any other kind of history means again you know we know more about world war 1 than influenza and world war 1 killed fewer people than influenza globally in fact global death count of world war 1 is lower than just how many people died in india it is the influence so many many reasons but i think this is one definite and of course like you rightly said it's tragic and we want to forget it and if there's no clear enemy then you know we tend to forget it but what i found while writing this book is when you scratch the surface you do find 
you know, memories. So I found this oral history from Central India. And this person told this doctor just last year, this doctor had gone for COVID-19, Dr. Vikesh Kolkunde, and he's asked villagers, you know, have any of you had these experiences before? The old person stepped up and said, you know, my grandfather told me a story that in their time, about 100 years back, it was so bad that they dumped all the corpses in the bullock cart. They gave the driver a pint of alcohol uh, to drink to you know, get over the stench and told him, go and dump the bodies in the jungle. So, you know, that's a very powerful memory. It's lingering around. But it's it's there, you know, 100 years later, that memory of presumably the flu pandemic of 19 is definitely there. But it was not, you know, registered at a national consciousness level. I think it may also have something to do with who writes history. So as you mentioned, I certainly, you know, I I was a keen reader of history in my school year. So I remember my, you know, childhood history textbooks quite well. And Jallianwala Bagh was, of course, a big one. When we talk about 1918, 1919, you know, I've learned about the Russian Revolution more than about any, any tragedy that happened in India. Or, you know, even something banal, like, I think I recall, you know, Indian National Congress, you know, Motilal Nehru was the president and it happened in Amritsar, you know, the way we needed to learn where each national congress was conducted, you know, the annual meeting and things like that. So those things we remember. So does this have something to do also with the fact that the way history was written in India post-independence is because of a particular dispensation who also happened to be, you know, the major party in the Indian nationalist movement? And that's why those are the events that seem to loom big. So, you know, we do hear about the plague in Bombay, right? We hear about how it became a huge municipal election issue. We hear about Gokhale, you know, winning the election. Uh, We hear about Tilak, you know. So any part of the epidemic or the pandemic which has to do with the nationalist movement slowly trickles in and makes its way into the history books and everything else seems to be forgotten. Absolutely. Bang on. The people who wrote the history textbooks, especially, you know, right now, it was, of course, an epochable moment, you know, throwing out the British 1947. So clearly the emphasis was, how did we do this? And that was a lot of pride giving, saying that, look, we could do this, now we can do anything. So there's a lot of kind of inspiration building, there's a lot of heroes, national, the construction of national people and so on. So that was the emphasis. In that, of course, you know, I think that emphasis from freedom fighters and so on, it basically became a political history. But what strikes me after writing this book is that if the Indian National Congress, you know, was instrumental in writing our history textbooks after 1947. They should have, at least the historians should have seen how critical epidemics and pandemics were in shaping the Indian National Congress itself. And how, like you mentioned, you know, how important plague is for not only Gokhale and Tilak, but also Sardar Patel. Yeah. You know, his, his first job in life is in Ahmedabad as, as a municipal uh, committee member uh, handling plague. I, I mentioned other leaders in the book, Sabri Bhattacharya is another person who comes to mind. But now after writing this book, you know, in fact, I see our freedom movement through pandemics and the three pandemics, you know, cholera, plague, and influenza. So I now think, if you see 1857, the mutiny in the by some, by some you know, terminology, the first war of independence, that came on the back of a massive cholera epidemic. Right? So 1857, cholera. And then if you look at 1896 to 1918, the real foundation of, you know, of the Congress party, the split of the Congress, extremist moderates, it's all happening in, in the backdrop of plague. You know, the year in which they split is the year of massive plague mortality, one million deaths thanks to plague. And then, of course, after 1918, Gandhi comes to fore. You know, Gandhi's real emergence in the international scene is in 1990, 1990. So, in a way, looking at our own freedom movement through pandemics, we'd say 1857 and cholera, the rise of the Congress and plague, and the rise of Gandhi and flu pandemic. You know, it really, the, the pandemics actually bookend the freedom movement itself. And I think that that's that's something which I kind of stumbled upon while doing this. But you're absolutely right. You have a specific question that the historians who wrote this, you know, I've, I've gone back to the history textbooks. There is no mention of the flu pandemic. You know, I think the fact that 20 million people, even if you don't accept my figure, I mean, the, the estimates now are between 10 and 20 million, it's higher than the famines. You know, there's no famine also, which people are saying, you know, I mean, the Great Famine was supposed to be six or seven million, and it's so what, 1876. So this is the worst disaster. It's not just like a disaster. It's the worst disaster in Indian history, which is completely forgotten. And that's one of the reasons why I wrote the book. I said, you know, there is no book on this. 
this is, this is a, uh, an opportunity to kind of uh, write some one fascinating thing about what you just said is how there are moments in the indian nationalist history and the political movements which bookend these pandemics and i wonder how much of that has to do with existing disapproval of the administration or you know a lot of disgruntled people because when there is a death and a funeral in every home this is not a happy group of citizens right and how much of that automatically fuels you know any movement that is against a particular kind of administration it could be at the municipal level it could be you know east india company it could be at the national level right the way they come out is through some other event which is political or social or you know in elections or something like that it would be the equivalent of historians presently and people in the future reading about 2020 and 2021 as the year donald trump lost and you know had a coup in washington dc right and i live in the area and it's a really remarkable moment in my own memory but 2020 and 2021 mean something completely different to those of us who have lived through it but i wonder if historians in the future will remember it like that that's true i mean the, the pandemics get political you know and so everyone's trying to prove a point that uh, as a point out you know there's a lot about the pandemic that we simply don't know while we're living through it you know to say that somebody has performed better or not i mean there's just so many reasons that you know Uh, going to pandemic management, and you're right that you know this. I mean, I, like we framed it, you know, if you see this as a year of, of Donald Trump rather than the pandemic, the pandemic is the override. And the pandemic is used then, of course. As, I mean, the ex- underlying anxieties are played on in various ways. Now, in India, if you ask me, like you know, I think it was a mistake to have all large gatherings. Yes, right. But people who are you know anti Modi will say will point out about the elections and the coup. But people will pro Modi will point out to the farmers' protests, right? And so this is the classic way of and people. So the the BJP side today is basically saying the farmers' protests started the pandemic, yes. <laughs> and, you know, and and these uh, and the other guys are saying you know the election rallies and the Kumbh Mela started and fanned the pandemic. And of course, scientifically, all we can say is that all of them were misguided <laughs> in the sense that you know all large gatherings, whether it's even you know a large religious gathering in your small town, was also uh, uh, not advisable. And so. clearly i mean it, it's it's a very partisan topic now all that's it's kind of it's playing into existing polarization existing divides and so pandemic kind of you now here's an opportunity to you know take your you know, strong position so the kind of reason debate definitely you know dies out uh, along with so many other things uh, in the pandemic and so that's one casualty i learned more about cholera during my time walking through you know european cities and cemeteries the first thing that strikes me is how far we have come you know sort of the great escape uh, as angus deaton calls it the number of kids who are dead the number of young women and you can quite clearly see that this is you know a family area that are like four you know tombstones for little children or infants and you know the mothers clearly died in childbirth and you can very quickly put the story together in your head similarly even if we go hundreds of years back the black death seems to be a collective memory that is very well preserved right so not only is this well preserved in terms of you know historians having written about it there are modern day economic historians who continue to write about black death and you know the various consequences that may have come of it and and some of them are quite counterintuitive children in school in various parts of europe still study you know the black death and know a lot about the plague anything to do with rats and rodents and public sanitation is sort of incredibly high in the european consciousness in a way that it's not even true for the united states you know you don't see a similar you know public memory of an event like that what is it about that particular event which doesn't quite copy for the other plagues you know whether this is you know and it can't just be the number of people who died because you know cholera wipes out 10% of egypt and you don't see this emotional or public memory in egypt relating to cholera or even other pandemics that's a good question you know I thought a lot about it what well, is of course the region spread was very wide you know and I mean, much of europe collectively saw this so if you travel within europe from one place you could talk about it now with cholera that happens only in the late 19th century but otherwise it was more endemic in india it kind of it was never really you know also even when it broke out in new york and so on at the same time it was not affecting many other parts so it happened in like different points of time in different places whereas the black death the core part of it 
hit so strongly between 1348 to you know 1352 that pretty much all of Europe in that time collectively experienced that that pandemic. I do think it is a bit about numbers as well because we're talking of by most estimates one third of the population. So in relative sense, I mean the numbers must have been small because the overall population has been smaller. But one third is huge, you know, because they're saying like. The flu pandemic of 1918 hit 6% of India, which is huge, 20 million, but it's 6%. One third, if these estimates are right, is much more. Right? It's virtually like completely families you know, destroyed. So I, I think it's a combination of these two things. That Europe collectively saw it because it spread so fast across the region at that time. And then you know the fact that so many people were affected. I also say we, we think Black Death as those four or five key years. But plague actually hits Europe again and again yeah. until about 1720. So plague as a disease is, so black death is one event, but of you know particular time. But plague comes again and again, some places hardly ever, but like it, it's last registered in Europe in a big way in Marseille in 1720. You know, so between 1350 and 1720. And that is why when it hit India, you know, in it hit Bombay in uh, Hong Kong in 1894 and Bombay in 1896. The British went nuts because they were just, they they had, they, they remembered London in the 1660s, which you know, fell to the plague. They remembered Black Death. And when I w- was going through these reports, you could see the collective memory. These were officials, doctors invoking the Black Death, invoking the 1660s London outbreak. So, you know, you could see, it's not that they forgot, it's clearly then. And that's why they went into overdrive, saying it, Whatever cost, you know, we are not going to allow plague to reach Europe. Uh, of course, that was the operating stance. You know, I mean, they didn't say at whatever cost we will not allow plague to reach Punjab from Bombay. But Punjab was, you know, eventually battered uh, from plague. But in their collective memory, they had, you know, uh, registered it. Earlier. There's no doubt that they clearly saw plague as the in a hierarchy of diseases as the worst disease possible. Some of it might be endemic and some of it might also be just how visual it is, right? Plague and smallpox leave a lot of visual evidence behind, you know, for those who are suffering from it or have it. Whereas things like influenza and cholera, they kill so swiftly, right? Without that kind of, you know, major physical evidence left behind that it might just be harder to record or remember. Same with malaria, right? It's just you don't have like spots on your face or like, you know, huge bulbous, you know, armpits and things like that. So it might just be some of it. I think the way we record things is also how it looks visually and and how people describe it. Yeah, that's a fair point. Yeah. And the earliest instance of example, I think, plague, smallpox and all, you know, go back to these mummies that they've uncovered, because again, of these physical markers. And so that's why, also, if you look at the social, societal level response, very stark when it comes to plague, precisely because of the visual markers. You couldn't go out because you had these marks on your body, especially with smallpox and so on. So in that sense, you're absolutely right. The malaria, influenza, even the coronavirus, uh, you get high fever. You know? So that's, that's uh, you, you, don't, you don't get these big boils or big uh, stuff uh, growing on your body. So that's the big difference. Cholera is somewhere in between, I would say, because you didn't have to go to the toilet. When you see the descriptions, it's it's quite painful for a lot of people because they will have to keep a lot of you know, stool passing and so on. So it, it, I would rank cholera like in between plague and smallpox on one end and say malaria on the other side. What was the impact of the pandemic on social segregation and caste? I mean, obviously, caste segregation precedes any pandemic in India. It's not the cause or the consequence of it. But... Does this change things in any particular way? I know there was, you know, the way you have witch burnings and in in Europe you had, you know, literally Dalit women being burnt at the stake saying that they are the cause for cholera and things like that. What does it do to urban scapes? What does it do to the way people live with each other, the way they treat each other or, you know, the way they interact with another subgroup from another caste and so on? I think in the 19th century world in particular, you know, whether it was London or cities in India, Interesting. You know, the rich often survive these pandemics much better than the poor. And the poor saw this often as a way of the rich to eliminate them. You know, so there are a lot of these complaints saying that, look, this is a disease brought to eliminate us. They don't like us. They don't like us you know, as human beings. And hence, uh, these diseases have been artificially brought to, to wipe us out. So that was one kind of you know, interesting class kind of divide. And so you had some riots and so on. 
uh, as part of that. For example, when when plague happened, a lot of the poor who were displaced in those ev- evacuation, they said, or oh, when they were pressed for you know segregation to hospitals and so on, they said this is all a ploy. They started spreading these rumors that the British are in taking people to hospitals to extract fluids from their bodies and, yeah. and so on. So definitely a lot of class co- conflict, the pandemics uh, added to that, and in the Indian context, definitely caste. I'd say the death rates were so staggeringly, you know, different. The lowest ranking castes in the traditional hierarchy were basically just smashed out by the pandemics, basically because of nourishment. You know, so infectious disease obviously are going to be much more deadly if you're not eating food, if you're not eating food. So in the 19th century world with famine, with droughts, you know, all those kind of situations, these infectious disease. So when I looked at the numbers, you know, in de- death rates in general, was something like 10 or 20 times higher than, say, the Brahmins or the Parsis or even the British by the late 19th century who had nourishment or even soldiers and soldiers had good nourishment compared to them, you know, people sweeper, different classes, almost 20 times. Death. So that's another way in which, you know, caste obviously matters in a pandemic that is, uh, people. but I'll tell you the story of cholera. I have a map in this book of your caste level village map. It's an interesting case of how caste itself was used to another science you know, in, in, a, in a pandemic. And this is a case where, you know, John Snow in London had shown in 1854 about the waterborne, theory of cholera and incredibly for 40 years after that the british officials in india did not accept john snow's theories this is the famous hand pump at broad street that that he tracks exactly yeah and every gis class in the world starts with you know this this famous thing of how you can use maps to solve epidemic puzzles john snow had done this in the 1850s and the european cities had started investing in water purification systems and but for 40 years these very stubborn British officers and Indian medical, Indian medical service officers insisted that cholera was airborne and not waterborne. Yeah. And one officer in Madras Presidency in South India uh, wrote a book called Cholera and Water in India. And you know he draws this map of a village level map and he shows a street. One side he calls it, I think, high ranking castes. Other side he calls it, you know, lower castes. And he says in that in that particular village, interestingly, it was the higher castes who got cholera and not the lower castes. And he draws these wells on the map. The two wells were contaminated with cholera. And because these guys from the other side of the street would not drink this water, they kind of escaped that contamination. And the only person who got cholera from this side was a washerman. You know, so again, so he went on this very beautifully kind of explained why cholera is waterborne. Uh, unfortunately, he was not taken seriously in his time. It was only about 10 or 20 years later after him. Uh, by 1900s, you know, the medical establishment accepts finally that cholera is waterborne. So interesting ways in which caste has, you know, entered the equation of pandemics, especially in the 19th century. I think one huge casualty of some of these pandemics has been the Adivasis, right? And, you know, like, you know, the whole wiping out of the Bheel population in parts of Gujarat, like, you know, these are large communities that have lived and Adivasis always lived in a particular kind of seclusion because, you know, they were, they were forest dwellers and, and, or like, you know, mountain dwellers. You know, they didn't have immunity for some of these diseases. So it's very similar to, you know, say the natives in Australia or the Americas being completely wiped out by smallpox. And, and you have something similar going on in Adivasi populations. Yeah, there's some, there's a paper of the 1983 pandemic by David Hardiman and he looks at the Adivasi tribes in the border of present-day Maharashtra, Gujarat thing, in which he points out one district was badly affected, one district was not. And so, of course, the histories, he taps it from, again, typically uh, doctors, uh, missionaries, and so on. A, a side angle to this whole you know, story of Adivasi epidemics is, of course, epidemics were used to convert, of course, a lot of people, especially into Christianity. You know, so that's also a side story. A large part of this conversion story in India also happens on the backdrop of uh, epidemics. But yes, I think David Hardman's work on Western India is one of the good works on Adivasis and epidemics. I think there must there must be good work. I mean, I'm pretty sure both cholera uh, and plague, plague especially outside Bombay, uh, Thane and so on, which has a lot of uh, tribal populations out there, they were also badly affected. As I mentioned, this oral history quote I of Dr. Yogesh Kolkande of this, you know, bodies being dumped in the jungle that comes from the Gond tribe, in Central India. So again, these oral histories, you know, somebody can do a nice project on this to go and capture memories of the 1918 flu pandemic because they must because central india was completely knocked out and a huge part of central india is adivasi population 
So it must be che- must be preserved in local memory. Itself. About the preservation of memory, one reason for it, of course, is that we are terrible at counting deaths, right? In India, in the subcontinent, the first sort of you know official death registry system comes with the British, which is also a consequence of the pandemic, as you as you point out in the book. Even today, I mean, we're talking twenty twenty one pandemic. Other than very big cities where the municipalities are functional. and the you know crematoria and the cemeteries are supposed to get a death certificate you know record a cause of death and then follow a protocol in most parts of india we simply don't record deaths you know no matter what the cause so what is going on with death registration in india you know is the state capacity is it cultural is it some interaction of the two is it the fact that majority of indians cremate as opposed to bury yeah i think of course there's huge variation across india you know i live in gujarat gujarat has close to complete registration and also i would say massive under reporting right now due to covid but if you look at up bihar it's definitely linked with state capacity the weaker the state the weaker the funding the weaker the, the public health system the weaker your you know a death registration system is going to be so there's no doubt if you look at it's clearly related with per capita income or something so if you look at you can measure this how do you measure this you have the death registrations and then you do what we have in india sra sample registration system where you do the sample surveys to estimate death rates and you can compare yes. death rates you, you can compare how many deaths certificates should have been issued in that year vis-a-vis how much were issued and so that's called the completeness coverage and so we know completeness coverage is very poor in up or uh, npr uh, having said that we do have the census and in the census from 187 1881 at least has been happening every 10 years except maybe this year and i used for example the census of 1911 and 1921 to estimate how many people must have died during the influenza of 1980 it's a guess of course but but the point is the census is nice because think about all these people dying or their bodies being dumped in the ganga you know, just like in 1918 and unfortunately it's happened today exactly now there's people say there's no way we'll know the numbers which is absolutely true because they're not being registered there's no death certificates for them But the fact is that if they were enumerated in the census of 2011 in some village of India, that village is going to see a gap when we see the next census. So this is not real-time data. You have to wait a few years. But the fact is, it is still possible to estimate that because we know it's happening. It's not. It's not the kids. It's people in 40 plus age group being affected. So you can do like cohort matching between 2011 and 2021, 22, and find out the gaps. And so when I was doing this research on the flu. The first numbers on the influenza pandemic were actually six million in November nineteen ninety, and that was also, of course, caught the headlines. The difference is today, you know, we have a national scorecard on deaths. Back then, you had city level scorecards. People knew Bombay. People knew how many people were dying every day. People in Delhi knew, and this was published daily. But nobody aggregated. It. You know, they didn't have the technology to aggregate. Uh, so that came out in February nineteen nineteen when Norman White, the Sanitary Commissioner of India, published six million deaths, and that became the rallying point number. The next Visitation to that number came from the census official of 1921 in 1923, and he basically notched up that number to 11 million. You know, said that, and in, if you read the census of 1921, all the provincial reports, it's amazing because they all literally struck by how many villages are depopulated. You know, so it it did leave the its trace in in the census. So we'll also find out, I think, especially UP, I think, is substantially depopulated in certain cohorts. Uh, because of the pandemic, I think it's it's. I don't want to be a uh, reckless, but I do think it's a substantial toll that's been taken in in UP right now. In terms of how can we improve this or death reporting, how do we understand the scale of the tragedy today? As I said, the underreporting factor back then, I estimated was three. That is six million reported deaths, and my estimate is twenty million. And I always thought that three is like the upper bound. That is, you can't really have plausible underreporting factors more than three. And my look at the Gujarat data now is—it's—it's it's in double digits now. The underreporting of deaths, from what I understand. So since I worked on this last year for 1980, I thought I should work on it this year as well for the current. And I mean, the number for Ahmedabad, I can tell you, is four, which is the lowest in Gujarat. And it's one of the most functional municipalities, Ahmedabad, right? Exactly. So you're already at a huge advantage. Yeah. Yeah, and that's underreporting of four. Of course, this will vary from state to state. Of course, there is genuine underreporting. There is underreporting at the hospital level. Hospitals, have, so this is about incentives. Hospitals don't have an incentive to report 
deaths. So they're going to fudge data. Fudge in the sense, it's not even fudging. It's just saying this person tested negative but died. So it's not COVID. Right? And I, I mean, this, you know, this book I've written is dedicated to a friend of mine, uh, our institute's librarian, who, who passed away in the first wave last year. And he tested negative and then passed away a day or two later. And he sent us an email that he's tested negative and we were so happy. And just a day or two later, he passed away. Now, his death is most likely not recorded as a COVID death. But the obvious case is that if he had not got COVID, he would be trusted. Right? So it is, in a way, a COVID-related death. That, that's going to be huge in India. You know? So even without any deliberate government cover-up, though that is also possible, even without that, we are going to get underreporting factors of more than three, which to me is amazing because 1918 was horrific and you got underreporting factor of three. And if you get more than three, say, on average in India, then obviously, you know, we are looking at more than a million deaths by, by any way you look at these, these numbers, unfortunately. So it is, it is quite a horrific second wave that we are living through in these times. I mean, for me, you know, it's, it's amazing because last year and not just last year, even years before that, I've gone through so many old reports especially newspaper headlines of these pandemics, that a lot of stuff which happened in the last one month, you know, I said, I've seen this headline before, you know, the bodies in Ganga, I said, I've seen this before. This Virtually everything that's happened in the past month, it's almost like a beja woman for me as a researcher, because I've spent time in these archives, these, you know, old, old newspaper headlines, it's so the, the death scorecards. A couple of thoughts on that. So one, when you talk about using the census and you see villages are depopulated, now, of course, we know that it's influenza related, right? Because that's what's going on. But how easy or difficult is it to parse out that X number of people died from influenza, the disease? Y number of people died because there was a famine right before or a drought right after and they were already hit by influenza and they were malnourished or the other way around? Or the third category, which is, you know, the able-bodied members of the family are dead and now children are orphaned or, you know, elderly are left to fend for themselves and then they die because, you know, there's there's no systematic support uh, structure that we have socially for these people. And so you get like maybe an entire family that is wiped out, whereas only two members out of 10 or three members out of 10 may have actually died of influenza. How do you resolve these kinds of problems? Are there ways to estimate or is it one of those, this is influenza related, so we just, you know, kind of put it under one bucket? It's a great question. Very challenging, very tough, but it can be done to a certain extent. You know, let me just Point about the drought that you mentioned, because we've not talked about that yet. 1918, as I've argued in the book, you know, was unusual, not only because of influence, but because India registered its third worst drought in recorded history, as a result of which massive food price inflation happened, especially in Western and Northern India, where mortality, case mortality rates were unusually high. And so I'm arguing that, you know, it's not temperature, but really the drought and food prices, which kind of killed more people and Eastern and Southern India. I mean, that Every, I mean, I'm arguing that about 40 to 60 percent of India have got influenza, right? But the people who died as a proportion of it was much higher in Western than Northern India because of the drought and so on. So the valid question to us is, is this because they didn't have food or is it because of influenza? So the way to disentangle this thing is to look at when they died. You know, if it was just about food, you can look at the past famines. The past famines always happen in the year after the drought rather than in the drought, right? So it, I mean, arguably in 1918, if influenza had not come, you know, we would have still got a few hundred thousand deaths because of the famine the next year. Because what would happen typically, in, if you look at the previous famines, that is 1876, 1899, the drought would come, the food production would fall. People would have some buffer stocks, but those buffer stocks would last them for a few more months. And by the time the next year came, things uh, would get really bleak and then they would start dying off in large numbers next year because the human body can resist for a few months. So this is a classic you know, anatomy of India if you look at the, when the drought happens and when people start dying. Now, if this was not influenza, you know, people should not have died so much in October and November 1980. And why is it that only in October and November, when people around the world are dying, you know, they're dying also in India? You can look at the weekly data, you can look at the monthly spikes. All of it is pointing. It was recorded as fevers because fever was the, the symptom. You'll see even in the all cause, because they did provide, you know, for whatever limited registration they had, they had six categories of deaths. You'll see that the other numbers are not going up. You know, it's basically fevers which is spiking. So there are ways to kind of say, you're absolutely right that I cannot say with precision that 20 million people died 
it's, it's a guess. What can we learn from the way you've estimated in the past with how we estimate in the present? Because we're having the exact same problems 100 years apart. I think we need to classify deaths better, very honestly, as simple as that. Which means if a person goes to the hospital and dies even after testing negative, we should say it is COVID related in the sense that that person had COVID a few days or a week before. I mean, what is happening now is often by the, the time of the first test when it's positive, and then the person, unfortunately, say dies after 10 or 15 days. By the time the test is taken, then you know, it's negative, but the person unfortunately dies. So there's a large, even with honest governments, there's a large part of deaths being wrongly classified as being not COVID related. And hospitals have all the incentive to classify them as not COVID. Because the minute you say COVID, on the government's dashboard right now, they're not tracking non-COVID deaths. So if the hospital is reporting more COVID deaths, more attention is going to focus on. So this is a classic incentive problem. And that's why the central government really has to say, I think they're doing it now, saying, you know, just because there are more deaths, we're not going to penalize you. Anymore. I mean, I can tell you, just my gut feeling is that more people have died in Gujarat in the second wave than in Maharashtra. That's my gut feeling in terms of COVID-related deaths. And that's because of obituaries, right? In the regional papers, you see 12 pages, 15 pages of obituaries. You're not seeing that in Maharashtrian regional papers. To me, that is a smell test, you know, for what is going on. Yeah, I mean, and and also journalists have not really taken on the mantle really bad. So that's my gut. But if you look at the reported numbers, Maharashtra is way ahead of Obisha. So there is a a political, you know, uh, you're an expert at this, you know, uh, how should politicians be responding? I mean, in my book, the last chapter starts with this quote from the Arthashastra, you know, which remarkably the Arthashastra has a quote saying, you know, basically have good data reporting systems at, at the ground level, which I think has huge relevance today. It's, it's a classic problem, but there's no doubt that one or two years down the line, we will get to know a picture of some estimate. This current death distribution of COVID-19 is going to change so drastically in one or two years time when we get more data. You know, I agree with you that it's not some huge conspiracy because you can't conspire like this at the national level, right? Some of it is just bad incentives for the hospital. The second is the way ICMR tells, you know, Indian hospitals to categorize deaths. One is, of course, if you're COVID positive and you die, even with comorbidities, it's a COVID death. The second is a COVID probable death for those who had a negative test or did not test at all, but died of the same symptoms. Now, that needs to be done through an audit committee and there has to be like a committee of doctors who actually evaluate all the deaths. Now, the problem is in a pandemic with already weak healthcare capacity, that simply can't be done, right? And your morgues are overflowing. You have no time to do autopsies. You know, literally hospitals and morgues are begging family members to take, you know, those who have deceased away as quickly as possible because they just can't handle the burden. So now you have a situation where before you know it, someone has come in, they've died in a matter of days, The body is gone. It's been cremated anonymously by someone because COVID protocol doesn't allow family members to enter. And now all record of what may have happened is just completely wiped out. So that's one. Let's say someone 100 years from today is looking at the current pandemic, right? And they say, look, let's just look at excess deaths in Delhi, right? Anyone who died in this three-week period, there's a very high chance that it is COVID. Now, I think that's a very reasonable assumption. Having said that, One of the first things that's happened in the pandemic in Delhi is that hospital capacity has just been completely overwhelmed, which means that people who are non-COVID are also not being treated, right? So this is, you know, people who are cancer patients and dialysis patients or someone who came in because of a heart attack or a motorcycle accident and, you know, so on and so forth. So now all that stuff is going to get lumped together with... COVID deaths, which may still give you a decent estimate of COVID deaths. We triangulate and we look at, you know, the time and the weekly spike and so on. And I just feel like there is, I don't think there is a very good substitute we have come up with so far for, you know, recording cause of death accurately at the local level. And the only thing we have in India, and this is true, you know, for tuberculosis, true for malaria, we just do this through verbal autopsies ex post you know, a health survey that is run every few years. And then you realize that, oh, the number of people who died from tuberculosis. I'm just concerned about that sort of thing, you know, 
when it comes to covid because i don't know if we're going to get good fatality rates and infection fatality rates for the second wave yeah. it's kind of crucial for long term development uh, you know whether it's vaccination whether it's treatment protocols right this is like a really critical thing and we just don't seem to have a handle on it yeah i mean if you look at case numbers also after look at these numbers I mean, the only metric that makes sense to me now is the test positivity ratio right because that's within the cases cases are a huge undercount but within those cases you know how many are testing positive right i mean that's giving you some sense of the the how exactly. kind of infectious it is uh, at that moment. so if if that's going up and that's falling down you know that's maybe saying that uh, it's, but again that's also to some extent a function of testing capacity and so on we probably need better metrics definitely you know to understand i think one basic metric which these journalists in gujarat uncovered is the death certificate data but the only thing is people should not be punished for reporting honestly you know and not have a kind of political sling match uh, but that be a terrific data point you know to have just the number of death certificates issued every day of course last year there was a problem you know lockdown there were fewer deaths because of uh, you know fewer accidents in many places and so on yeah the gujarat thing is interesting because these journalists compare 2021 to 2020 and the gujarat government is not disputing the 2021 numbers they are disputing the 2020 numbers saying it's artificially too low and hence excess deaths are too high so i'm doing some work on this uh, and you know of course gujarat government does have a point that you can't compare to 2020 but however you look at it it's an under reporting factor of uh, order of magnitude there yeah. when did flattening the curve become a thing in pandemics right we don't hear about this much in past pandemics that could partially be because we don't have good healthcare systems and most people you know are poor and they can't quite afford it this is before the great escape the entire focus has been on let's make sure the health system does not get overwhelmed we don't have a cure but we can manage the symptoms and we can deal with this right so to keep the death count low when did this become a th- part of pandemic management strategy in india and how closely is it linked to state getting involved because for a very long time poverty and people's individual circumstances were responsible for pandemic right the plague in 1897 is the single most important juncture i would say plague was probably i mean the most important incursion that the british empire made into the people's lives they started quarantining system in a big way and so on and it came from this idea they didn't use the phrase you know bend, uh, breaking the curve or flattening the curve but the idea was to contain plague in bombay city you know so it, it, the idea was to do that and they said that we will do all we will take what it takes all the restrictions possible to do that Uh, they didn't shut down the railways in fact they had special trains to ferry out migrant workers back home but i think that that way it really came about and you know between august 1896 and february 1897 so much of activity was centered in bombay finally they came up with that law you know which we are still using today the epidemic disease act of 1897 so that's the strongest legacy so i would pinpoint that law february 1897 as the first real you know epidemic epidemic management policy that india started off with and of course it was hugely you know clamped down on civil liberties and so on uh, and of course even last year there were some concerns uh, over it there's no doubt that you have to do a bit you know if people are going to roam around as they want things would uh, get out of hand so obviously something has to be done it's it's about striking that balance i, I would say that's really the starting point of this idea of restrictions in india of breaking down the transmission but in the time of plague nobody knew how it was being transmitted and so that's the really funny part of the plague on ein side yeah. because they thought that you know by doing these measures they would none of it actually matter you know and they're finding about a coronavirus you know they are finding with each passing day many of the things we took for granted last year surface transmission people are saying you know not very important now so we learn along the course of the pandemic and we take we overreact and then kind of you know find out what is really important uh, and then start uh, scaling down so definitely this to flatten the curve as a concept to buy time to ramp up medical infrastructure and not put too much case load i think that whole concept is very much new now in the sense it's really coming off age globally with covid i'm not an expert on sars or mers and so on but i don't think those guys use this terminology uh, they just shut down because it went haywire you know in china and so on so this is very new uh, and it'd be interesting to find who are the you know ideological you know uh, uh creators rather of this particular phrase i mean there was I there was an article on medium.com something which went completely viral across the world saying what's happening in italy last year in february 
and why one needs to flatten the curve. And I think that whoever wrote that is probably the person who really popularized you know this phrase. Uh, of course, the joke, as we know in India now, is that you know we in the second way we flatten the curve on the wrong axis, so on the y axis rather than the x axis. <laughs> in the cases I've just shot up through the roof, so that's that's the other other flattening of the curve. But I think it has something to do with universal healthcare in your European countries, right? We are very Eurocentric even today in the way we report on these things, the way we think about these problems. Europe did not, I mean, initially it had the big spike, but it's nowhere close to the highest death count or anything, anything like that. And I think public healthcare and universal healthcare have a lot to do with it. You know, the idea that this can't be scaled up very quickly. So now what we need to do is we've got to make sure that infrastructure isn't doesn't collapse so that more people don't die. I think that might have, you know, something to do with where the terminology is coming from, because it assumes a certain inelastic supply of healthcare. And we know that certain healthcare, of course, you know, certain aspects are relatively inelastic in the short run, like, you know, doctors can't be magically increased in number or nurses or technicians, but you can increase the number of beds and the number of testing centers. And, you know, those sorts of things are extremely elastic in, especially in the middle of a pandemic. Unless you throw people in jail for, you know, gouging on price co- oxygen concentrators or something like that. <laughs> These things tend to be elastic. So I think it might be coming somewhere from there, but I haven't quite quite figured it out. But this seems very new. It's a good perspective. I, I'll just build on to that. You know, you're talking of like flattening the curves as a, as a phrase. You know, what's interesting is when even the phrase public health, you know, really emerged, especially in India. And I kind of argue in the book, that it happens after the flu pandemic. And interestingly, the word before that was sanitation. You know, so the leading health official in India was called the Sanitary Commissioner of India. And by 1920, that or 1921, this designation is now the Public Health Commissioner of India. I think that gives you a clue of the world before 1920 and after. You know, sanitation was the obsession, and that moves to a more holistic kind of idea of public health. And I think that is an interesting kind of break point that happens out there. Yeah. And you know, so I want to go back a hundred years again and talk to you a little bit about the science, right? So now sanitation is always the obsession because we partially are constantly blaming in these narratives. We're constantly blaming, you know, the poor and the fact that they live in filth or, you know, the urban areas, which are full of rodents and we don't have very good control studies. As you said, even after Jon Snow's, you know, revolution with the with the Broad Street hand pump, it doesn't penetrate, you know, public consciousness and manuals for the next 40, 50 years almost, right? So there's that going on. And then at some point, it shifts to this idea of Western science, right? Now we have these studies. Now we know what is the cause. This is a viral infection. This is a bacterial infection. This is spread by rat flea, you know, and this is spread, which is airborne and so on and so forth. Or with, you know, cholera, it's waterborne. Now, where do you think that switch happens from saying that, you know, all of this is because of witches and superstition and culture and, you know, people living in filth to some kind of systematic, you know, Western science or the tradition as we know of it today? There is really no survival advantage that Western medical science gave, especially living in India, vis-a-vis, say, Ayurvedic practices or Unani practices or Siddha practices and so on. But by... 1905, you know, it was a huge difference, right? And so this is a difference which there's, I would say that difference is also not there in 1850s. It starts from the 1860s and it kind of builds up. And, you know, you can actually see this in the numbers and the, the, you can see it in the data on the mortality rate of Britishers in India. You know, so that's a nice metric to look at because Britishers were dying at about the same mortality rates as Indians in the early 19th century and even up to the 1870s. The decline starts happening in the 1890s. And they start doing this. Sumit Goh has some excellent work on this. It's that the death rate, especially infant mortality rate among the Britishers in India, it starts declining because of not just medicines, but practices. Yeah. You know, the idea of living in, in clean environments, the idea of washing your hands. And there's a massive propaganda which about, you know, about cleanliness and so on. That's the context in which medical improvements lead to, you know, reductions in mortality among the British. And among the general Indian population, that is to wait till only after 1920 when death rate starts coming down meaningfully. So this is a critical period, you know, 1860 to 1910. I think the way Western medical science demonstrates its utility is really in curbing cholera. Because cholera 
does not really devastate Europe anymore after 1870 or so. 1866 is the last, pretty much. Uh, similarly, in the US. So in Latin America, cholera still devastates you know, the late 19th, early 20th century. That's why Marquez has this book, Love in the Time of Cholera and so on. Yeah, it's a beautiful book. Yeah, and, but, but North America and Western Europe kind of are have escaped cholera because they kind of understand the value of prevention, that is thanks to Jon Snow, and cure, which is coming out slowly from vaccines developed you know, by people like Hafkin and so on by the 1880s and 1890s. So this is a paradigmic shift which happens in uh, medical traditions, which for centuries across the world thought that all diseases were because of you know impure air, but the miasma school of thought. And this is kind of a big shift which happens. And of course, the field of bacteriology emerges thanks to Louis Pasteur, Robert Koch, people like that. Vaccines emerge. Uh, vaccines were there before, but they emerge for these new class of diseases. So this is definitely a foundational shift. And it's only by the 1900s really where you know you can clearly say that Western medical science had a superior, clear superiority in handling many diseases over, say, Ayurveda or you know, Nan uh, and so on. But it takes time to filter through. And then you have Indian scientists. You know, one of the things I mentioned in the book is also the role of Indian scientists in ending some of these pandemics. Like cholera, this guy called, uh, you know, the SN uh, day in Calcutta in 1950s, very late in the day, of course, uh, you know, finds what exactly is cholera. People say you should have won the Nobel, you know, for, for getting that. So how are, who are these scientists? They were trained again in the same schools which are training the British uh, British guys. But that change had happened. You know, that, that kind of thinking had happened by the 90s. So 1900s, I think, is a critical decade because people could demonstrate that if you use certain methods, you could actually end these pandemics. Having said that, the 1918 flu pandemic was a complete mystery. You know, nobody really understood what hit It still them. is. It still is. And people thought it was a bacteria. You know, they thought influenza was a bacteria in 19. And so this is the, the kind of takeaway from that particular history is that every generation thinks they're at the cutting edge, which they probably, we know, we probably are. But there's still many things we have no clue about. Right? And so think about yourself in 1917. We have about 40 years of research showing you how to end cholera. Plague, and we're very triumphant, saying nothing can happen now. You know, we have, uh, we are understood what these things look like. And then comes influenza, which people think it's a bacteria. And it takes another 100 years to find out actually, you know, what happens in 1918. They were reconstructed that virus only 20 years back and so on. So what is the coronavirus, you know, 100 years later? Well, maybe somebody will write a book saying a lot of the things we are doing this year are completely useless. You know, what we should have been doing is X, Y, Z. No, absolutely. That was actually going to be my next question that, you know, your son asked you to explain what is a pandemic. And my sense is his grandkids, you know, when they read their great grandfather's book are going to be like, oh my God, I can't believe they were using steroids or, you know, they were using plasma. And I think a hundred years from now, you know, there's also going to be some hilarious things, right? Of course, every generation thinks differently. But what is it, what changed in Western medicine, you know, in those two decades is, is one of the things that is mysterious to me, right? Because as you say before that, between, you know, South Asian, East Asian medicine and Western medicine, there isn't really that much difference in outcomes. In fact, not medicine, but, you know, some of the, the subcontinent's practices, like, you know, vacating the entire village when the rats start fleeing or dying. You know, this is not a medical practice, but it is some kind of, you know, oral tradition which has been passed on, which seems to work in containing the plague. So some of it might even work, right, uh, when it comes to these methods. But what is it? Is it that the West got rich? Is it better money spent in on R&D? Is it trial and error and experiments? Is it that they started writing these things down in a way that Asian cultures are all about the oral tradition and not really writing down manuals? What is it about those two decades that just completely changes the trajectory of how we think about medicine? That's a good and very tough question to answer, simply because, you know, it's uh, so in economic history, a lot of stuff that we do is about divergence, when and what, what, when and why, you know. Exactly. And the way to answer this, I mean, there's so many ways to look at this. What, starting point would be, you know, the science, the enlightenment. You know, so the enlightenment as a starting point. I mean, you can't get guys like Louis Pasteur, Robert Koch without the enlightenment. As simple as that. And so you're much more likely to have a person like Louis Pasteur and Robert Koch in, you know, Germany and France than in India where, you know, enlightenment ideals were there, but, you know, not as well entrenched as they were in. So that's definitely the foundation on which, you know, uh, modern, and by enlightenment, 
you know, for the listeners, we're looking at mainly 17th and 18th century kind of diffusion of a particular method of doing science and so on. So that's definitely there. I think this thing about capacity or, you know, public money, I, I've not seen the numbers. I don't know how much the governments were investing. On cholera, I know they invested hugely in water prevention, you know, water purification systems. So that seemed to matter. But on medicine side, you know, on, on, on scientific, were there prizes that incentivize them? Maybe not so much in biology, you know, maybe not so much. It, the Nobel Prize starts much later uh, as, as, a, as a big draw. I think the pandemics themselves, you know, it's, if you if you ask me, you know, why is it that it happens in 1890s and not 1790s? Is because cholera, plague were huge problems of the day to be solved. You know that was the kind of burning concern, public policy concern, which drove. So if you ask, why did you know why did Valdemar have to come to India? Uh, he had, I mean, absolutely no reason to come to India, but he he came with this idea of also helping people and saving lives in a great pandemic. But so I think the pandemic context itself was very important of why so many discoveries and so much of investment was taking place in not only like public health systems, but also in, in science. So if you see people like the, like Louis Pasteur, he's, they set up these Pasteur institutes around the world. You know, they, they kind of a diffusion of this, this model around the world, uh, Robert Koch, and they were competing with each other. We might also get competition into this, you know, that is, uh, who will be the first to decipher the plague bacteria? You know, the, they were like teams which ran to Hong Kong saying, you know, let, 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 can I be the first person? They came to Bombay. You know, Bombay had, a, had all these people from around, you know, different countries of Europe coming to test samples and so on. So it, that competition also might have helped these guys, you know, trying to get, get to the heart of medicine. But the, one of the things I noted in this book, in, in 1883-4 is around the time when the Berlin Conference happens when Africa is, uh, the, the road to Africa's colonization really uh, starts. And that's the year in which Robert Koch goes to Egypt and then, you know, uh, later on Calcutta to test his findings. And so there is this backdrop of imperial rivalry also, which is driving. And if you can show that, you know, you're a powerhouse which can which can curb pandemics or curb epidemics, I think that it, it's, I think the, so one actually interesting way to look at this period then is to look at why did we say, why did the Americans send a person to the moon in the 1960s? You know, and you, I think you'll have to take into account the US and Russia space rivalry and the whole impetus then to do it. And that's why it happened in 1960s and not in 1920s. I think that's very similar to what happens out here. Uh, it's a combination of the pandemic context and, you know, the imperial competition of those times. I think you're absolutely right, uh, you know, on one aspect, which is that is also when you see a huge elevation in the status of scientists. They become people who, you know, now appear in front pages of newspaper. It's not just politicians, right? And it's not just the monarchs. Now you have scientists who have become, you know, part of popular culture and people can say their names. You know, the same thing that happened with the people who went on the space missions, right? Like I knew the first dog that went to space, right? And and, and Sputnik is now a vaccine. Sputnik is now the name exactly. of the vaccine. <laughs> I want to talk to you about something that is sort of linking your previous book and your current book, your your previous book. It's a sort of history of India told through mobility and movement. That's the way I think about your book. The way epidemics which are endemic to a particular region become pandemics is obviously through mobility, right? So this we understand. And as we go farther back in history and modes of transport are slower and trade routes are very specific. You see pandemics spreading in a very particular way. You don't see them like spread, you know, that quickly. And as, you know, more recent parts of history, you just see the spread of these things happening very, very rapidly. And, you know, as you said, there's no surprise that, you know, Bombay is this hotspot or Hong Kong is this hotspot because they're also huge ports. Egypt, you know, because of it's such an important spot in the trading route because of the Suez getting badly infected. And now we're in the modern world of air travel, right, where now things happen to spread in a matter of hours and days as opposed to years or weeks, uh, as it may be the case. So how should one think about this? Because you get the same arguments over and over again. You get the same arguments about quarantining and lockdown and keeping people out and travel bans and so on and so forth. There's a recent paper by Michael Clemens and Thomas Jins on how travel bans don't work, right? Even with the influenza pandemic, it delays maybe at best by a few weeks, you know, not even by months. And the economic loss, uh, that's the way, of course, all economists think about this, the economic loss because of 
quarantines and because of travel bans is just massive firstly i mean the link between the, the the two books i mean i get this question often you know you you work on migration how do you get pandemic the fact is you, you can't have a pandemic without some migration you know that as you said it, it goes from one region to another through some movement. it could be systematic migration corridors or travelers or however but mobility is at the heart of the pandemic uh, which also means curtailing mobility is a uh, important but not the only but is an important ingredient of curtailing the pandemic and so obviously some curbs on mobility are important otherwise it will rip through like wildfire the question is so it, it's boiling down then to intelligent design of you know of uh, restrictions on mobility here i make a difference differentiation between international and internal migration you know, so uh, and I, i think i'm one of the few researchers maybe in the world who's working on both right because most people these are these are two classic people who work on only international only internal migration i think it's still possible it's also feasible and enforceable to shut down airports to shut down you know so it's easier to curb international mobility with visa vis internal mobility and we saw this classically in india last year you know we shut down our airports yes with the lockdown you know uh, uh, nobody tried to swim from you know uk to you know india but if you shut down the trains people will just walk back home so this idea that you can always walk back home means that that option to migrate internal is always there so that's my first point that is it is almost impossible to place curbs on internal mobility and i think one of the things i appreciate about this year's approach to our uh, risk containment strategy is that we have not shut down the railways for instance you know i think that caused more problems last year i mean the idea is noble if you shut down the railways there will be less spread of the virus and so on but what we got then is these massive migrant refugee camps where more people huddled up in dense clusters making the virus spread even more so it all sorts of like un- unseen kind of effects now on international migration it's a really tricky issue you know how do we because they are they of course geopolitical stakes you know so if a country says no to another tra- uh, country's travel so all sorts of permutations and combinations but if you look at what australia and new zealand have done you know, they they of course island kind of you know countries uh, they've been very stingy right they they've managed compared to the west they are way ahead despite a similar age profile they're doing well on the death count and so on and they basically shut themselves in the world and they they are as reading articles saying australia is planning to shut itself for another two years uh, and so on so those are so they are kind of valuing the possibility of the pandemic they're playing much more you know weightage on that and saying you know basically nothing doing international there's another view on quarantines at right? singapore plus saying you can come but you have to go through a rigorous process but we will pay for it i think that's classic you know so so i think that's a possible model where if not the government but there's a kind of a split a public private kind of partnership where you pay for some of the services the government will chip in i think that's the real if you if you ask me you know uh what is the way forward if this and should we just be shutting down airports and starting them off i think that's suboptimal you know i don't think we should be shutting down completely of course it might happen that other shut down to us uh you know if 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 they uh, see the threat perception as such but i don't think it's a wise idea so definitely don't shut down internal mobility by shutting down trains and so on uh, on the international front if you if you want to uh, shut down i think you know sensible quarantine systems with you know this is a medical call how many days or weeks uh, that a person has to go through the critical component there is who's going to pay right and so that is basically the solution that is you don't want it to be so prohibitive that nobody comes in that is suppose i want to go to the us but they say that you have to go through this quarantine system which is extremely painful and that's a disincentive for me uh, so how do i make it it's it's a win win for both these countries if say a software worker goes there for a project for 3 months and then comes back you know so ideally there has to be a mechanism which seamlessly does this as well as protects the citizens of america and india when the person comes back from catching some new variant and so on so that's my sense i mean a lot of interesting work which is happening on migration optimal lockdowns in terms of international internal migrations uh, optimal quarantines but you're absolutely right that the debates on this because it's a trade off it is a trade off uh, between this lives and livelihoods Uh, and so you know it one has to have a, a sense of balance there's no doubt that if a pandemic is completely raging you know the airports will shut down it's it's raging across the world the airports will have to shut down and so on so in that sense this year's call i think on restrictions i think mid was much more sensible than last year's uh, which i thought was a completely trusted uh, but having said that even this year i thought you know i've been tracking these mobility numbers i think a lot of state governments were very slow to start imposing restrictions I mean, if you see what happened this year 
you know maharashtra went into this lockdown kind of mode the and, and tamil nadu went i think last week or something you know in in the full uh, of course some states had elections and so on but i think up if you look at up they have reduced their mobility so slowly you know over the course of the and last and they've had a kumela i mean yeah. for heaven's yeah. sake right not only have they is it a question of not reducing mobility swiftly enough you are increasing mobility and inviting next year's problems to the current year right yeah so it is it was you know very unfortunate that happened uh, i think with internal you know you can actually track this through this google mobility data which i'm finding quite useful i have a paper on this actually using some google mobility data so what we found interestingly we did you know some very rough estimates so last year i had recommended lockdowns right because we didn't know the extent of the devastation and whatever basic capacity count i did for healthcare capacity in india it seemed like it was very fragile right now then of course the lockdown happened and i thought you know it would be good social science to just go back and see if the lockdown made sense right so one of the things we did was because it was a nationwide lockdown and you know de jure you have the same rule but de facto the rule is obviously implemented differently so now how do we get a good metric of whether the lockdown really happened and if people were moving around and we thought google mobility data is probably the best metric of that so that's kind of how we came to it uh, me and my co-authors you know abhishek chautagunta and gp manish and what we really did was we said we were looking at two things we said does the lockdown reduce mobility and does a reduction in mobility also track with reduction in number of cases right so it's a two step thing that we are really checking so we saw that in some places you know these are typically states like you know maharashtra delhi tamil nadu you see that the lockdown really helps because there's a drastic drop in mobility and with the drop in mobility you see a decrease in number of you know covid cases and as mobility goes back to trend line you see an increase in number of cases so you can clearly see that the lockdown works but there are a bunch of states where there's a drop in mobility even though there was there is no significant change in number of cases right and some of the extreme examples of this is places like sikkim where there were zero cases to begin with and there are zero cases throughout the lockdown and hardly any increase post the lockdown and then there are some fascinating instances like bihar for instance where you see a huge drop in mobility initially but as mobility picks up with the migrant workers coming back and you know so on there is no increase in the number of known cases you know per 100000 that is per capita so what we found was very mixed results that lockdowns at best were a partial success and we concluded that lockdowns should be at the state or local level don't have a centralized lockdown because it just doesn't make sense you know these hotspots are not developing everywhere simultaneously but having said that the problem with that is exactly what you pointed out right which is you are now going to leave it to the state government and some state governments are going to be quite proactive maharashtra is relatively more proactive some state governments for political incentives like you know uh, the elections are not going to be proactive and some are just asleep at the wheel like you know uttar pradesh and bihar and you know that nothing's going on there so there is this problem you know this is the part of the dysfunction of indian federalism which is you don't want these things to be too centralized but do decentralized governments at the state and local level actually have the capacity to make sensible decisions uh, and that of course is you know not the case it's, it's a big trade off lives versus livelihoods i think uh, it's it's a really tough one and, uh, and and if you're a policy maker literally you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't it, it really it com- it's coming down to that i'm curious why the focus is not more on testing we figured out fairly high sensitivity very very good tests for covid and somehow the focus has never been on testing other than places like south korea you know initially which really ramped up their testing and did a fantastic job of how they were tracking the the spread of infection i don't know why that is still not you know even now there are countries that don't require a test before you enter the country and you know those things seem very bizarre to me that's true i think i think testing is you know hugely important i was just listening to an interesting observation today on on testing that is uh policymakers are afraid of random testing in particular in times of you know less when the curve is going down for example in uh, december january uh, some uh, a particular doctor you know mentioned this uh, today saying we approached the government saying we need to ramp up testing now when there's actually you know not too many cases just to get a sense of what's what's happening and the government said you know if we go for testing now people will think that something is in the air uh, and lead to kind of a panic situation 
right? And so it's interesting that the case against testing also exists from the perspective of that, which I thought you know it didn't make any sense. Uh, but but this is apparently how you know some some people think think about. It. But there's no doubt you know we we've lacked behind tests. And even worse is the fact the compl- the complacency that you know uh, struck us after the peak in September of the yeah absolutely uh, meant that testing is like bound down. Uh, forget ramping up, it was bound down substantially. Uh, so this idea that testing is an important or testing data is an important weapon in this uh, fight was completely thrown out of the window. I think this goes back to what you said about enlightenment values, you know, understanding that more information even if it comes from trial and error and not all of it is good and you know better data and better tracking is a good thing is once again a very enlightenment sort of value, right? True, better science. One of the things that struck me in the book is again how quickly religious super spreader events keep coming up right the kumbh mela makes an appearance many times in your book as does you know the hajj pilgrims going to mecca right and there are you know i mean there's also local level things like you know the puri temple so this keeps coming up over and over again how religious events are partly also on a spike in years of pandemics because people feel like they need to pray they think it's an act of god and they want the pandemic to go away and they think religious you know ceremonies will help with that but they end up becoming super spreader events very quickly yeah i mean i think it it starts a pandemic creates anxiety and you know religion is is of course uh, as somebody has famously said opium of the masses but in a pandemic it really becomes you know even much more more than that in the sense it it's historically been used for scapegoating right so uh, i mean the, the first pers- the first question that all of us ask us is you know who started this right and so there's still a lot of theories as to where does this virus come from because you, your life is completely overturned there are restrictions you see people around you dying and so we are looking for a cause for it you need to attribute it to something so you can either like a finance minister say act of god right uh, which is uh, the classic kind of uh, way to look at it or you can find someone to blame which is the classic outsider uh and so if you see the black death you know jews were blamed back then in in in, in europe uh, jews have been blamed for many other you know uh, epidemics in, in europe in history uh some of those tropes in india like i mean in in plague and europe in european history uh this is this idea that jews were poisoning the wells you know this is like a rumor uh and in india and punjab you know there were this rumor that the british are poisoning the wells yeah so that's like a big big trope but religion definitely you know scapegoating and i think the british did a lot of this in in uh, india blaming pilgrims the indians basically said look if you provide better facilities at the pilgrimage sites this should not be happening and it was very classic you know during cholera in particular because it was waterborne it was a fact that you know, these pilgrimage sites were problem sites but the fact is that you know indians have been doing these pilgrims for centuries uh, for millennia uh, so it's it, from the indian perspective it's like you know what are you saying you know, this is our tradition how can you stop this uh and uh, the british on their part did not do enough to invest in you know, good facilities at the pilgrimage site which could have easily curbed uh, the epidemic outbreaks from those uh, places in the 19th century world the religion in india in particular you know really got into the way of pandemic management uh, at many crucial levels and the british also after 1857 and the plague backed off earlier you know people would just pray uh, today we pray and you know do other things like go to a doctor and so on so that in that sense the value of religion has definitely gone down you know uh, in relative sense that is where it was the number one recourse today there are also other recourses uh, uh, available and so on uh, but three you know pandemics and religion also means that there will be religious uh, let's call these you know spiritual gurus or religious gurus uh, who will also win more popularity and also lose popularity Right. and so if you go to your local you know spiritual guru and say you know save me and if the person can't save you then that person has no value no spiritual uh, uh, you know no healing powers because a lot of this this is let's call it the healing market right uh, and uh, they derive their powers in the ability to say that you know we can heal and if that doesn't work you know people uh, so in the book i mentioned this you know one particular thing about uh, uh, kind of different temples in calcutta competing for you know uh, people and so on Uh, so that's one thing that you know definitely is related with pandemics also the fact that new people come up so uh, just today i was reading newspaper headlines in women in uttar pradesh are lining up to a temple called corona mine right and so yeah, a new i saw that too out, out of nowhere 
so that's another way in which you know, religion and pandemics intertwine. That is new kind of deities emerge uh, and, and, and new kind of things. So there's a waxing and waning even with, so there's a kind of a shift happening in that. And I discussed earlier this, in the 19th century, it was also used to justify conversion by the British, uh, you know, especially Christian missionaries saying that, look, we are offering a most superior uh, civilization and so on. Uh, and we can uh, cut down your mortality rates only if you convert. You know, so that's that's the uh, the other uh, 19th century kind of uh, uh, not not just 19th, even 20th century episode of how religion and pandemics were intertwined. So scapegoating, conversion, uh, new deities. I think these are the ways in which they are often you know, connected. Some of it also coincidence, right? Like, you know, there are these temples, uh, you know, there are the cholera temples and things like that in southern India. And some of it is the deity might have saved you just because you went to a different water source. You know, you go to something on top of a hill and that becomes the plague temple because the rats are not there at the top of the hill. And, you know, those those sorts of bizarre things. I mean, with coronavirus, it's very simple. Think about it. Case fatality rate of 1% means 99% are going to survive, right? So in the sense... If I was in the spiritual market, you know, I would I, I would just cleverly replace myself because I know whatever I say, 99% of the people are going to survive it, right? So there's a very good chance. Unlike plague, unlike cholera, which were less virulent, but they had case mortality rates of 80%. You know, plague was 80%. Yeah, they're incredibly high. Plague, you were going to die as good as that. Uh, so there, the, the, the value of the spiritual guru really mattered because if that person would say that, you know, you would not die, but if you're going out of... Eight, 80% kind of uh, chance of the probability is very low. Today with coronavirus at 1%, you know, you can say anything. You know, I was seeing a tweet. Somebody said, you know, eat popcorn three times a day and you'll survive coronavirus. But statistically... Chances are you will. <laughs> you will. <laughs> I, I, the only thing I so far agree with, uh, on, with our health minister is, uh, da- eating ja- dark chocolate three times a day. I must say, I have been following this advice for a very long time <laughs> and I uh, attribute all my good health <laughs> to consuming dark chocolate in copious quantities. You know, the thing you said about, you know, the statistically, you know, uh, when it came to the plague and all, 80% of the people died. There's, again, it got, you know, economic historians have done a lot of work on this where there are two aspects, right? One is the Malthusian sort of worldview, which is these plagues are coming because the world has become unsustainable and human population has grown out of control. And look at this, this is a natural redistribution. And as soon as it happens, the people who are left behind and who are alive are better off, right? That's that's one view. The non-Malthusian economic view, of course, thinks of this slightly differently. So, you know, this is work, uh, you know, for instance, by Kiesling and Haddock and, you know, how they show that in with the black death because you had about a third of the of the labor pool dying it fundamentally changed the relationship between human capital and physical capital and therefore the evolution of property rights they even attribute this you know eventually to the breaking down of serfdom in western europe for instance so you have both these views i believe even ram mohan roy said something along these lines i don't know if he was coming from a malthusian point of view or the other point of view but Very similar that, you know, yes, there has been this great devastation, but the people who are left behind are more productive given particular given physical stock of capital, right? There was an undercurrent, you know, of thought in some quarters where you say, oh, famines or epidemics, uh, of course, like this nature's way of, you know, checking the population, sort of a Malthusian kind of argument. With cholera, the numbers were still relatively smaller. They were localized in particular places and so on. I think it's really the plague where the numbers really start increasing for Bombay presidency, you know, for Javan. But really the big shock is the flu pandemic. Uh, and I do think, uh, you know, in the book, I argue that it's the starting point of India's labor movement is really the flu pandemic because the bargaining power of labor really tremendously increases after that. And the Royal Commission of Labor 1929-30 also pointed out that the inflection point in India's labor history was the flu pandemic. So so that's definitely, so the balance of power between capital and labor you know, shifts substantially towards labor in this argument of that the surviving labor benefits because you know so many people are there. I think you can really see that only in the in the flu and you're seeing it again only in Western and Northern India where a lot of people die, not so much in Southern and Eastern India. Uh, one argument of why you know uh, militant trade unions emerged first in Bombay rather than Calcutta uh, in the early 20th century could also be attributed to plague and influenza hitting much more yeah. in Bombay than in That's interesting. Calcutta. Yeah. So this so definitely, you know, this idea of surviving labor, you need to have a substantial labor supply shock 
in order for this capital labor relations to change. Now, even if it happens in one small city like cholera or plague, there's all this migration. So you lose, say, 10% of your labor, but people can come in from somewhere else and replace it. You need to have a shock which is substantially, unfortunately, huge across across the board in which even migration can't replace it, such that the, the, the people who own the enterprise have to give higher wages or you know more uh, benefits in order to induce people to come and work. And that really started with plague in Bombay where the cotton mills, you know, uh, they said, okay, we need this labor force. Uh, they're just going back whenever plague comes to their villages. Very similar to now, actually, uh, where this return migration has become a big issue. And say, okay, how do we give benefits? So today, if you see, to take the parallel to today, last year, a lot of these workers went back this year, of course, the th- trains are not shut down, but fewer workers have gone back. And that's partly because, especially in construction work sites, employers have made conditions for them better arrangements with the learning from last year, right? And so it's again a case of, uh, you know, a, a shock kind of leading to a changed uh, contractual relationship uh, between uh, the worker and the and, and, and employer. I want to talk to you a little bit about your intellectual influences, like what got you interested, you know, into economic history and, of course, then eventually in migration and since then in pandemics. Yeah, on migration, uh, I was in London in 2006 or seven, I think, and there was an essay writing competition on uh, development where next. And I I was a young student and I said, okay, development where next? I have no idea about this topic. So let me read a bit about it. And uh, there was a time when, you know, international migrant remittances suddenly came out on that international limelight saying that actually the, many countries receive more migrant remittances than foreign aid or foreign direct investment and so on. And so what can we do to ease the flow of migrant remittances? And so I wrote this essay, uh, which won that prize, by the way, on, you know, uh, migration as the b- next big thing in development, and how to facilitate safer migration. So, so that's really the spark of migration. If there was no essay writing competition, I would not have ever thought about migration. So that's a serendipity uh, element out there. Uh, but then I wanted to do my PhD in Bangalore, uh, at IIM Bangalore, and under this professor who worked on international migration, Rupa Chanda, uh, who herself was a PhD student of Jagdish Bhagwati. Uh, so, so I did my PhD eventually under her. But then during my PhD out there, uh, I said that international migration remittances, you know, some people had done work but nobody had really done work on domestic migration and domestic remittances. And so my PhD supervisor, who was really an expert on international economics, said, okay, go ahead. And she was fantastic. So she, you know, she gave me full freedom. And then I started working more on internal migration. Uh, and then, again, a chance encounter in the library in Kerala, where I found the uh, back series of the post office annual reports. So post office used to have these money orders. So the, this was the classic source of domestic money orders. Uh, and this library in Kerala had the back, back of so I was looking for a time series of postal money orders. And so I was going for, I was trying to find each and every postal annual report. And this shelf in this CDS, Center for Development Studies in Trivandrum, uh, had it going back to 1880. You know, so not like 1980, 1880. And they had every annual report of the post office. And I saw those numbers. And even in 1880, Bihar was like a remittance dependent car. Right? I mean, you could see how much money was going in Bihar. In 18, and that's when it really the light bulbs, you know, went in my head saying, look, what I'm looking at is not some sort of a new thing. Uh, you know, migration has this really long history in India and without understanding this history, I'm not going to get anywhere. So I had audited courses on economic history when I was at the LSE in London, uh, and Professor Tirthan Roy, who's out there, he's been a huge influence on, on, uh, the way I think on economic history and so on. But I came to Anne Ahmedabad actually as a visiting faculty to teach a course on business history. So I'm Ahmedabad, interestingly, was the pioneer of business history in India, the Professor Bhijan Tripathi. And so that's the connection uh, of how I came here to I'm Ahmedabad. So in a way, I'm trying to revive his legacy because he was a faculty for 25 years, from 1964 to 1990. Uh, and he really pioneered this field of business history. So I want to try and bring back that element of business and economic history. And I'm happy to see more and more institutes in India pointing people who do you know, both a bit of contemporary stuff as well as historical uh, uh, approaches so there's uh, there more and more you know, faculty being appointed across India. Uh, I think when I came to IME, I was probably the only faculty in India uh, you know, working on business or economic history. I think now it's still in single digits, but at least uh, it's, it's a small but growing tribe. Uh, I like to look at the big questions. I think, you know, you had Alice on your uh, program and Alice is also oh, yeah. these big questions. Yeah, the great divergence between uh, men and women. Yeah, yeah. That's exactly the kind of research questions I love. 
What are you currently reading and what is the big project you're working on now? You know, I continue my work on migration, uh, moving more from migration to cities. So cities is really the, the, the big thing I've been working on for the last five years. I did have a working paper in 2016 called The Growth of Cities in India from 1860 to 2010. And so the rise and fall of cities in India is something that fascinates me. So I'm reading a lot on urban history, urban issues, and so on. Regional development in India, you know, that's another uh, big passion of mine. So, uh, the courses I teach at IMA are actually more global in nature. Uh, so while I'm uh, still working, you know, I think the next few projects are India-based. I think uh, in a few years, I definitely want to start writing on countries outside India as well. Uh, and so I'm reading a lot on global economic history, global business history, and, and so on. Uh, particularly fascinated by Italy, uh, partly because I lived there. I lived in Florence for for a year. Uh, in fact, I've lived in London, Florence, and Bombay, all three plague hit places at some point. So that's another connection with pandemics. Uh, but but Florence was you know spectacular, uh, and I really got interested in Italian culture and history uh, uh, when I was out there. So who knows? Maybe someday I'll write something on you know, Italy. Florence is also great for things like studying business history and remittances, right? Because you've got the Medici's and their accounts of these single families going back generations. I read a fascinating paper and how the most influential families in the 15th century in Italy, especially in Florence, continue to be the most influential families today uh, in terms of concentration of wealth. What's your writing process? I, I mean, I find it astounding that you started and finished a book during the lockdown. <laughs> yeah, my first book took 10 years to write, as I like to say now. And my second book took 10 months. So some sort of learning must have happened <laughs> between these two things. But no, obviously, you know, if the pandemic, I really wanted the book to be published in 2020, in the year of the pandemic. Uh, and so that's really what, you know, pushed me towards writing. Obviously, a project of this kind needs ideally at least two years or three years and so on. And in, in normal time, if, if there was no pandemic in the world right now, you know, and I was interested in pandemics. I would have taken my time and written, you know, taken two or three years. It would have been even more you know, research and so on. But, they, but they, we were in a pandemic and I was writing this book, you know, during the lockdown. And so, so I definitely I wanted it to be published in 2020. So obviously it was a trade-off again between, you know, how much research I could do with, uh, versus getting it out in 2020. Having said that, of course, it was a very strenuous process in the sense of, uh, of course, I love writing now. It's become an addiction. Uh, and so uh, even, you know, long essay formats, I've been writing a lot. Uh, I wrote one on the founder of IIM, Dr. Kamla Chaudhary, uh, some months ago. So I think, I think in the last two years, I've suddenly loved writing, you know, which is, which is I think, an important part of, of write, uh, writing a book is to really enjoy the process because that's half the battle won. Uh, if you're going to get up and say, oh, no, I have to write 1,000 words today, uh, it's, it's not going to get you there. But if you can write 1,000 words and you're going to write an 80,000 word book, you need about 80 days. Yeah, that's that's the that's the magic of, of writing a book if you're disciplined enough. Uh, so I'll just say that you know I was very disciplined because I was working on very strict deadlines, self-imposed. Uh, but obviously, you know, I have a, a wife and son, so obviously this would not happen if if uh, family did not support uh, me. So and we were in a lockdown. So uh, you know, full appreciation for my uh, both my wife and son for uh, for for dealing with long absences in the office. I would literally get into my office at ten in the night. And come back at you know six or seven in the morning, and then sleep during the day. So completely inverted schedule for uh, months on end. Uh, to because I, I I work best you know during the night when it's completely silent and so on. Uh, and of course, so the fallout of that was that my family said you're not going to do anything now, not writing any book now for you know long, long, long time. So so this you know right now I'm in my uh, so-called vacation, summer vacation, and I'm doing absolutely nothing. You know, uh, just following the pandemic and so on, but uh, but it's it's not like you know I've got any projects on hand and so on. So this is my break here completely now from writing. What is that process like once you're in your office? Yeah, I mean it's important to have notes, you know, on a blackboard or somewhere where I can see from time to time. This it's very important to get the flow you know, to have this some sort of broad structure. Uh, but writing a, a a book, this is not an academic book. This is a book for a wider audience, which also gives you leeway. You know, now, uh, in fact, I'll tell you, when I write academic papers now, I, I just got a paper returned to me uh, on the revision. And uh, the last line of this paper was a cheesy kind of a line, uh, which would work in a book. Uh, but, uh, you know, this reviewer said, please take the sentence out. Uh, and I was like, my God, you know, this person doesn't have a sense of humor. But that's the kind of experimentation and leeway you can have in writing a book for, for a wider audience. It's a fun process. I don't listen to, I, I listen to music during the breaks. Where, you know, I'm just, obviously you can't write eight hours on a stretch. But this particular project was literally written 
in 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 not like fits and spurts. It was written just continuously over many months because I was just beating myself for this for this deadline. The first book was you know very much more uh, missed many 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 deadlines. I don't even know how it came about at the end. Uh, probably every first book is like that. You know, it just takes years and years. Finally, it comes out and so on. But I will say that the happiness of seeing the first book finally in the stands definitely you know was very inspiring to write the the second book. So I think one thing which I do. which i did at least for writing this book is that when the publisher and i were discussing the cover of the book you know the age of pandemics and so on and we had kind of finalized the cover uh, by i think by august or something we had kind of finalized this cover by i think august i printed that cover and stuck it on the bulletin board like you know in front of me and say look this is what it's going to come out to be <laughs> and so you better write today because that's how it's going to look in, in the end so if if you like the final product of how it's going to look at least you know, that will force you to well the bad news is i think you are going to have to do more editions of the book because you know covid is not in the rear view mirror as you had originally anticipated and now we are we are going through a second wave people say a third wave might be coming so i look forward to you know future editions of the book or you know a different book specifically uh, on the covid pandemic one last question which i ask everyone which i think is the most important during this pandemic what are you binge watching binge watching yeah the the binge reading along with my son that's definitely there you know he's he's going through all these comics and so on so i'm doing that i love that he loves tintin that, that yeah, makes yeah, me happy absolutely. yeah and we're doing this jigsaw puzzles which is great so last year we did the tintin jigsaw puzzle thousand piece uh, then we did a new one uh, we just finished one and we've just started van gogh's star starry night which is impossible i don't know how you can do you can you can't do it you just give almost given up you know it's it's all the same colors on every piece practically so uh it's a very tough puzzle binge watch i'm trying to think of the last you know series which i watched i've seen some good movies uh trying to catch up with some hindi movies which i've missed for the last year or two years and so on but i'm seeing more stuff with my son now uh so we watch we end up watching kind of kids movies but i saw a lovely movie which is very relevant in the time of mass mortality it's a movie called souls it's an animation movie and uh, pixar film and yes you know, it's people, beautiful it's 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 a very in a, in a time that so many people are unfortunately dying you know i saw this movie recently and it really touched uh, my heart then there's this gilby studio animation movies for kids which also fantastic so a lot of kiddie stuff but uh, amazing stuff i mean i rate these movies very very high thank you so much for doing this chinmay this was a pleasure thanks so much yeah absolute pleasure Thanks for listening to Ideas of India. If you enjoy this podcast, please help us grow by sharing with like-minded friends. You can connect with me on Twitter at S Rajagopalan. In the next episode of Ideas of India, I speak with Keshav Deshi Raju on his new biography of MS Subbalakshmi.